Welcome back. Hope you had a very good lunch and that you're full of energy to continue. Uh, we know it's a bit hard to, to continue with a conference after having such, a, such an amazing uh, meal, but we made sure to have interesting lectures for our afternoon session, a very interesting topic, AI, artificial intelligence. We are starting with our AI block right now, and uh, I would like to invite Mr. Christian uh, Heilmann from Microsoft to join us on the stage. Hello, uh, I've got a lot to cover and not enough time, so I will be very fast. Don't worry about it. If you cannot understand me, if I'm too fast, you're just too weak and you're already replaced by computers. <laughs> In essence, everything I'm going to talk about is at this URL, so actually if you want to get the information later on and I will keep everything there and write things down for you and explain things, that's where I collect all my information that is part of this presentation here right now. Now, Let's talk about artificial intelligence. It's actually not at all a new topic. It's going back to the 50s, the scientific part of it goes back to the 1950s to have a thinking machine. And if you consider um, like Jules Verne and all these kind of things in science fiction, it goes even much, much further. We always wanted to have this great computer that is just somewhere around us and there when we need it. And we always try, strive for that and try to do it. It's quite a hype now, though, and it's often very misattributed. So a lot of everything is, everything is artificial intelligence. Everything has intelligence in it. That's always my favorite when it's like, our system uses intelligence. And I'm like, yeah, I bloody hope so, because <laughs> otherwise I, I, it would be not a system at all. But OK, fair enough. It's an umbrella term for several things, and that includes like uh, math and science around repetition, pattern recognition, and deep learning and machine learning. The main thing why artificial intelligence became such a boost light right now is that our market needs a hype every half year. That's the first thing. But the second thing is that we have availability of hardware now. GPUs and fast processing processors are much cheaper and much easier available nowadays than they were in the past. So what was a deep learning system that took like eight weeks to render something in the past can now be like a few minutes even on your mobile phone or even on your desktop machine. There's a lot of myths that are going around about artificial intelligence, and it's very dangerous to talk to the press about artificial intelligence, because everything you say is being packaged up as like either Terminator or Star Trek. There's nothing in between. Either the computers will all kill us, or we actually will be in a world where we don't need anything but computers any longer. AI cannot replace a thinking, creative human. We're not there yet. You will have seen these kind of like where computers make like art or generated music and these kind of things, but we are actually still there to control it. I have no respect for computers. Computers are to me a shovel. I use a shovel to dig a hole. I use a computer to do boring things that I don't want to do. And this is why the thinking human being is something that we should invest much more in than in computers. AI cannot magically fill gaps in per with perfect information. It just makes assumptions. It compares and assumes. So when something is missing in your data and it does go to like the data set that has like millions and trillions of other things, it says like probably 50,000 times this was the right thing to put in, so I put that in. But it can still be totally wrong. It makes assumptions. AI doesn't learn in a creative fashion like humans do. We have several ways of learning. There's about like 15 different types of intelligence now and all these kind of things. And computers are actually just repeat the things stupidly as much as you can. And sooner or later, I will find some pattern and then I tell you this is basically it. AI has no morals and it has no ethics. And that's the problem because it can amplify our biases. So if our data sets or our questions that we ask AI are actually biased, then of course there will be a bias coming out of it. That's why you find things, for example, where an intelligent tab doesn't recognize people who are not white because all the testing people were white and they never, they never thought there might be somebody else who is slightly different than the people who wrote the software. So how can AI make our lives better? I love to take the positive spin on it because I'm a positive person. I like computers for doing things that I don't want to do and I want a nicer life. I want people to write, to create, to compose, to love, to have fun. I want us to use our emotions and do beautiful things and not become computers. They can help us with a lot of things. The first thing is of course automation. Humans are not made to do the same things over and over again because it makes us sick. 
It's a very, very bad thing for us. And when you can automate something that a machine can do for us, why not do it? It's a very, very good idea. Error prevention, like when the car realizes I should probably drive slower than I actually drive right now because I'm drunk or I actually don't, uh, I play on my phone, that's a good thing if that error is prevented for me. Or when uh, just, just typing a text and having typos in there and putting the squiggly lines under it, do you really want to send that email to your boss with the five typos in it? I could do better than that. Data reduction and muffling the noise. You get lots and lots of information with lots and lots of noise and wrong data in it. And uh, what AI can do is go through that data, filter out the wrong ones, replace them with the one that is, so you don't have to do that by hand. Prediction based on historical data. 15, 15 days in a row, you actually got up at 7 o'clock and you looked at the weather. How about my alarm clock tells me the weather at 7 o'clock in the morning because it happened? Plowing through massive amounts of data, we're talking petabytes, and we're talking huge amounts of information, historical information that humans just cannot go through because it would be repetitive, it would be boring, and we would make mistakes. Creating more human interfaces. Hello, computer has been a, 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 a science fiction trope for years and years. And being able to talk to my computer is probably a cool thing and probably the right thing to do for somebody there. I love when, then, when touch interfaces came out and people started interacting with their phone that would have never touched a keyboard or a mouse. My parents hate computers. They have no idea what they are. They scratched the card on their, on their bank card because they don't trust it. But they played the Wii when it came out because I told them, want to play tennis? You do it like that. And they're like, oh, cool. I don't have to do the joystick thing or something like that. That's exactly what I want. And it's a matter of size and strength. And this is where it goes, where it goes back to the, uh, to the machinery that we have, to the, to the chipsets that we have. We create a massive amount of information nowadays. Every second we create information. And a self-driving car, a clever system, a home automation system, this data goes somewhere and we create it all the time. So we have to find something to plow through that data and find the information for us that is necessary. Is it partly automated, like a self-driving car or like uh, sensors in the machinery is automated? But social media also turned all of us into publishers. We actually, we, we type things, we tweet, we go to Facebook, we upload pictures, and there's never been that big before. I used to work in Yahoo when we had Flickr and people upload like five photos a day or something. And nowadays, like click, 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 selfie, live streaming, every, everybody wants to be an own TV channel. And we, this data goes out there and nothing is done with it or a lot of stuff is done with it without us telling what is being done with it, and that's where it gets tricky. It's tough to make that amount of information consumable again, because if 6,000 of your friends or of your friends on Facebook send 6,000 photos, <laughs> you actually should be kind of filtering down which ones apply to you the most, and that's where a machine uh, a learning or a deep learning algorithm can find out what did you like the last 50 times. Okay, you probably want to see those 10 things and not the 6,000 photos, which of course is dangerous because you only get the things that you like. That's why a Facebook news feed is not a news feed. It's just like your likes for you. Please click, give us more information, these kind of things. And that's why we have computers. Computers do these things for us. They plow through the information. The algorithm finds us the things that we want to have. And with cloud computing and on-demand processing and advances in hardware, we are faster than ever. I gave up running things on my local machine as a developer that are data consuming. Even video editing, I do it in the cloud because I want to use my computer. I don't want to think, get hot because I wait for two hours because I want to do some computation. I can get a computer for a few, a few cents an hour and I can do it there. Now, bots and computers are great at doing tedious, boring tasks. They love it. Like, you give them data, and they're like, here's the same data again. Great. Here's the same data again. Great. Whereas, like, humans like, what the hell do you want from me? <laughs> Repetitive tasks that reach a result by minuscule changes on every iteration are easy to automate. Plow through this until there's no error in it anymore. Change that triangle to a circle until it looks like a circle. Humans don't want to do that. Computers are happy doing that. Finding patterns and comparing them in a simple fashion is what computers and bots are good at, too. Like, once again, you uploaded so and so many pictures, you probably like these pictures, too, because we find the pattern that matches you and that what is you like. Humans, on the other hand, are a different beast. We're messy and we make a lot of mistakes. And humans are also get bored easily by tedious, repetitive tasks. And what happens when we're bored? We make more mistakes because we're bored and we don't want to do it. That's why people hurt themselves in, comp in factories. That's why automated machines are better for doing these jobs. Human communication is not streamlined at all. 
It's full of complexity and misunderstanding. I mean, I, I'm a lot in America, and I use things like satire and, you know, like, like sarcasm, and people are like, oh my god, you're a horrible person. And I'm like, no, actually, that was not horrible. Okay, fair enough. The intonation of how we say a sentence can make a massive difference. That's why finding the right tone for a Siri or a Cortana is the next big thing that every company needs to do. We need to get emotion out and information with it. As humans, we're good at that. As computers, we're crap at that. So humans and bots, computers together, is the communication is kind of weird. It always feels like it's not quite there. We saw earlier that robot that was cooking with the woman. When, when, she, when he was looking at her in the middle of the night when she was going to the fridge, that was creepy. <laughs> you know, I, just, I was like, what? <laughs> Don't tell me what to do. I, I bought you, you know? And we don't want to speak like a computer. That's why people are really bad at using Google or Bing or other search engines because they didn't, in the past, because they didn't ask proper questions. They asked human questions. They asked, like, where is the nearest restaurant? And computers weren't good enough for that. It needed, like, restaurant near so-and-so, minus this, minus this, to get information. Computers can pretend to be human are creepy. Like these things that are really like, oh, I'm your best friend right now. Please tell me what your problem is. Like, um, okay, my bank account doesn't work. Why do you want to tell me hello first? For decades, only those who know how to talk computer had fun with them. I had fun with computers from the very beginning. My first basic computer didn't have anything to, to store things on. I wrote the same program every single day when I was 12 years old and turned it off again. And next day, I wrote it a bit better. I loved it. Other people like, what the hell is wrong with you? This changed when smartphones and home automation services became a thing. Smartphones are now, everybody has a computer in their pocket and don't even understand what the thing is doing anymore. And home automation systems, Alexa, how are you doing? Or Cortana or Google Home, what are you doing? I always liked that. If like five years ago, I would have gone to everybody like, can I put a microphone in your house that records everything and unencrypted sends it to an American company? <laughs> no. Like, what about it tells you the weather? Okay. You know, we're using these things without realizing them, and that's kind of worrying. And we're not at the Star Trek Jarvis level yet, where you have like a, a, a computer where you have a repartee with, and it's funny, and it's engaging. It, we're not there quite yet. The easier it is for humans to use systems, the more information they add. That's why Facebook is so addictive. It's like, oh, likes, likes, this, update. And then out of a sudden, people put lots of data in there, and then they wonder when somebody does something nefarious with it. And they're like, OK, where did my data go? Now you download it. I've got 12 gigabyte on Facebook. I have no idea how they ended up there. I just uploaded stuff and wondered about it. The more information a system has, the better it is at comparing and predicting what you like to see, because it knows you what you like, and it knows where you're going with it. And computers are good listeners, and sometimes they've been listening for quite some time. They've been listening on us for the whole time, and we didn't even realize it. When George Orwell said there's going to be a camera on every corner where big people spy on you, what he forgot to predict is that we're going to buy these cameras that spy on us. Now, humans and computers can do nice things together. For example, this is a thing by Google called AutoDraw. And what it does is you can paint something, and you can have no talent for painting, like me. And then it actually says, like, OK, you probably want to do a circle here, or what do you want? Oh, there's another circle there. Oh, you probably want to do some glasses. And then you can click on the top there, and it changes it automatically to a pair of glasses for you. And you can doodle this way and make like really nice interfaces, really nice slide decks. And the thing is, how Google knows about this is that they based it a few years before on another game where they asked people to draw something and teach a computer what a helicopter or what a bicycle or something like that looks like. That I love. If you give people the information or make it a fun way of giving people data to enter data and then give the data back in another system that makes the life better or easier for those people, this is what we should have. Not record our data, mine it, send it to advertisers, and then leave you in the lurch. Google also has the recapture system, which is a, a, a for, for that bots can't, uh, can't send uh, comments on your website. And this lately has become that image thing here where you actually detect where these things are. And they use that, for example, first of all, to scan books for Google Books. When there was something unreadable, they showed it there. Nowadays, they use it for cars. And nowadays, they use it for street signs. So basically, self-driving cars get that information. So they give you a service to make your website more secure or get less spam. And at the same time, they're training a system for the next iteration of technology, which is cool. Amazon had a system called Mechanical Turk in the past where you could pay people to do a human thing that only humans can do. 
and then actually get the information back in an API level so you can use it in your code. One of the first things was uh, uh, draw a sheep that looks to the left, and that was use Mechanical Turk. Over the years, Mechanical Turk, of course, fed the AI engine of Amazon, and that's why Amazon's AI is pretty, pretty amazing. But people basically paid for a service for humans to do. Amazon took their share of that data, and we're there. Now, intelligent responsive systems is what I want to build with this information. And the most important thing is that the data we recorded, machine can make impressive assumptions. You can make clever things to make the machine appear human and give you right information right at the start where you want to have it. These help to create more human interfaces that are easier to use, and the quality of these interfaces are depending on how much data you have. And as such, it's probably a good idea to do a third-party service because you yourself cannot compare with millions and trillions of photos because you don't have them. But uh, Bing, which is a search engine, you can Google for it in case you don't know it, has indexed <laughs> images for years and years, and we actually can compare these things for you. Now, most software players have machine, uh, machine learning APIs that you can use, cloud APIs. These APIs get you the insights back as JSON when you send some data there. You can also use pre-trained models of your own hardware, like on ten, uh, with TensorFlow on your own machine. Every Windows 10 machine now allows you to actually run a trained model on the hardware itself, and you don't have to go back to the cloud, and that avoids latency. You don't have the 2.5 seconds to talk to some American server, but instead you've got 20 milliseconds to talk to your hard drive on your own machine. So Google has them, Amazon has them, Microsoft has them, IBM has Watson, which I didn't list there, but I will soon as well. Now, what do we do with these things? The first is language and writing. The first thing we did with, with learning machines was actually translation. Take a text, translate it into something else. That was just word by word, didn't make much sense, so people didn't like it too much. We moved then into natural language processing, where we actually took the grammar and the structure of the other language into consideration as well, and then also did language detection and did automated translation for you. Using these, we allowed people to write human commands. And these are quite impressive what you can do with these things if you don't even, and you don't even know it yet. But people who use a computer or a mobile phone for the first time, they love these kind of things because they don't want to type in keywords. So for example, how far I am from the capital of Denmark works in Google Maps. Where do I find a good restaurant around here? Well, how does the computer know what a good restaurant is? People's, uh, people's reviews. Show me documents I wrote five days ago with more than 600 words. That, that works on a Mac in Spotlight or in Cortana as well. So we can talk to our computer in a human fashion nowadays. The next one was vision. So when text became too boring, we actually added images to the web media. What we forgot about is that not everybody can see them, like people who can't see an image showing, uh, showing them an image makes no sense. If the image cannot be loaded because of some network error, that makes no sense either. So you need to put alternative text in there. Say, for example, you do a conference website and you publish your agenda as an image and you don't get, oh wait. <laughs> and this is where machine learning steps in and it helps turning an image into text that is indexable, that is understandable for a blind person that can be actually used for keywords. One of these systems we have already in place. This is the most beautiful dog on this planet because it's our dog. He's on Instagram and he's famous. And the other day I dragged it, for the, I dragged it into this PowerPoint and down there it said all text a dog sitting on a, night, a sidewalk. This is the AI engine or the, the cloud services that we have turning this into a text. So a blind person would hear this when they open my PowerPoint now. And I find that image later on as well. If I look for dog sitting on a sidewalk, it finds that image that way. It also analyzes the image and finds that the nose is in the middle and the shape of the dog and gives me different design ideas what would be a cool PowerPoint to use with that image without me having to know anything about beautiful designs or at least pleasing looking designs. There's also a great bot on Twitter uh, about this, like this picture for example, mom said you had to release my Xbox. And if you do just vision API in any tweet right now, hash vision and underscore API, it turns it into a text. So in this case, it says the confidence is 86% that this is Ed Sheeran standing in a room. So that way you can turn images into text by comparing it with lots of data we have already on the internet. There's an API for that where you can actually, for in this case, it finds out it's a train with people next to it. You get the tags, you get, uh, uh, you get like context of it as well, and you can put any image in there, get the information back. You can also do an OCR scan on images and turn images with text, like an agenda of a conference, for example, into text that way. 
You can also uh, have, have handwritten text from images. So you can like little sticky notes, and then you put it in front of the camera, and it turns them into text. Good luck with my handwriting. I can't read it myself, actually. <laughs> you can recognize celebrities and landmarks. So in this case, it finds the Colosseum in Rome, and the other one is Satya. It's broken because it doesn't recognize me as a celebrity yet, but we will go there. Face detection is where it gets really interesting because faces are a great way to log in. My computer, for example, which is not standing here, but it would be if I pointed there normally, is I can look into it and unlock my computer that way. There's three cameras in there. There's also an infrared camera in there, so it realizes I've got a pulse, so I'm alive, and I never had to type in my password again anymore. This is awesome. You can detect faces in images, and you can then cluster them. You can identify the face. You can say that's a man of 50 years, approximately 50 years. You find similar faces. You can group faces into different subsections, so that way you don't have to do these tedious tasks of copying and pasting lots of images into folders anymore. You can also detect if it's the same person in two different photos, and that way you can find out, by the way, Chris, here's your photos. Here's the 500 other photos where you're also on there. Facebook has that, where you get automatically tagged, which can be creepy as well. Imagine you're Superman, and you don't want to be known that Clark Kent is the same guy. It's not good. <laughs> Sentiment analysis is another important, important step, and I could talk hours about this. There's a great, uh, there's a great thing that finding out the sentiment of a text, image, or video can help with a lot of things. It can help you find, for example, a video that only the happy parts are there. I don't want to see the boring thing. I don't want to see the happy parts. I want the angry parts. I want to, in the text where people are dis uh, disagreeing with each other. I can detect which comment should be answered first by a help desk. The people who are most annoyed are probably the best to answer first because they, they then stop sending things in. The people who are happy with you are great to also find out because you can use them for quotes. You can see when users, are tra when users of a training course aren't paying attention. That's another great thing with videos. You find out that people are oh, sleeping away, whatever. And you can predict when drivers of cars get tired and say, like, wait, by the way, you're actually, shall I help you with the driving? Because you're obviously tired. This is a great demo by a friend of mine, uh, Susan Hinton, where she actually she makes facial expression and then gets the emoji on top of that. So you can download that code and play with it for, if you want with yourself. That's on your own machine. That doesn't have any cloud part of it. Speech is another big, big part. Audio interfaces are all the rage. Everybody wants to talk to their computer. You can allow hands-free control in cars, of course. You can have an always-on system that helps you without having to interface with it. And it feels natural. It has a massive sci-fi thing, like, computer, help me, turn on the light in the living room, these kind of things. Text-to-speech is very simple. You basically type in a text and a, a, a voice that's generated for you reads it out for you. Sometimes fun to read websites while you're doing something else. That's an API that's out there. Speech recognition, where you talk into it and it turns it into text. We had this discussion earlier where it's great in the car to, to dictate your emails and then send them off. And there's a great article on Smashing Mac by my colleague, uh, uh, by my colleague Hollander here, who has the rise of the intelligent conversational UI, where everything is explained how to do a conversational UI that takes voice and brings back voice kind of thing. Uh, he, he also has, an, he has a demo here how you can train your own system and you can set up your own home automation system. In this case, he controls the lights, and you can see you define the sentences that should turn on the light and turn off the light. A system called Lewis that does that for you, you can use that and play with that in your free time as well. Voice recognition gets much better once we have a known voice or we have lots of data. So, for example, when you have the different American presidents and you press the different audio streams, it finds out who is speaking. That's great for a video series as well, where basically you find out who's speaking when, so you can do the transition much better. And once the computer knows your voice, the quality of the text, con uh, of the text generated is much higher as well. So you can do this yourself with the speaker recognition API, where you can record different, three different sentences, and then it knows what the problem with your voice is, what your accent are, what your issues are, and the recognition will be much better afterwards. The, one of the last things I want to talk about is moderation. There are some things that are not meant to be consumed by people. People working on YouTube and having to look at like child pornography or look at like uh, uh, beheadings of people all day long are not happy people, and it's not a thing that humans should do. Computers don't need counseling when they see these kind of things, so that's totally okay, that makes sense. Known illegal and terrible content can be automatically removed, and that's what moderation APIs, AI-driven moderation APIs are working, and we're sharing them among these companies and Interpol. So known illegal content can be not uploaded to your machine if you run it through that moderator API first, because then you actually not have, don't have a problem with the law as well afterwards. 
So there's image moderation, text moderation, video moderation, and of course a human review tool if you're not quite sure if it actually did the right thing for you. Now, we always have to end with, the, with great power and great, comes great responsibility. And uh, I mean, the big thing that everybody talked about right now is Cambridge Analytica and why there's a controversy and what's going on there. And of course, there's ways for you, for us to work against these detection machines as well. This is a paper where you can put gradients inside an image. These images look the same for a human, but an AI see so it as a tabby cat in one case, and with a few gradients in the background or in, in between the pixels, it says it's guacamole, which of course is wrong, but is a way to hide your information from AI systems. So humans are fighting back as well. Now, our responsibilities. AI can be an amazing help for humans. An, in an interface that I can talk to is great for somebody who is nonverbal, or basically uh, uh, an interface where I can click different icons is for nonverbal people. People are not afraid of talking to a computer if it feels like there's com something coming back. It does need transparency, though. If you use people as data sources, then they need to know what you record and where it goes. It should be always a thing that they can say no to, and not just like, it's a free system and we take your data from you, good luck. When people get information filtered by an algorithm, it should also be an opt-in. Like, I don't want my Twitter feed to take all my friends out and show me things from Lady Gaga that I don't care about because it makes more sense for that company. When people need to have a chance to dispute when an algorithm tagged or disallowed them access. When I get automatically tagged on Facebook, I want to have a right to say no. I don't want to be in that picture. Untrained and limited data leads to terrible and biased AI results. And that's why you had like image recognition, finding people of color as like monkeys and these kind of things. You all heard the horror stories that were going out there. AI can answer questions, but it also needs good questions asked. When your questions are generic or vague, you get a bad result. With a human, you probably, the human can say like, well, actually, did you mean? But computers don't do that, did you mean? They just say like, ooh, here's data, have it, you know? Data is the new currency, and I think it, le it needs as well protected and handled as money is, and actually even more, because it's people's personal lives and personal information. If you can avoid sharing data with a third party, that's a really good step. So I'm, I'm really happy that our hardware is becoming so good that I can run deep learning algorithms on the chipsets themselves rather than having to go to the cloud, but for now, the cloud is probably the only answer that we have. Data provided by the big players is a good start. You have millions of photos to compare with. You have millions of voices, millions of texts to compare with. But if you want to get great results, think about customizing those services. And we have a custom image search. We have a custom voice. Google has them. Amazon has them as well. So using the power of third parties to train your detection algorithm is a good idea. Use the cloud to actually train these things and then run them locally on the device. Keep them on the user's data device or on their own network, and you don't have the problem that data might leak to third parties that you don't want to have. The next step for us, I think, is build these human interfaces that are intelligent, but teach people about data security at the same time. It's not magic. It's machines that do repetitive tasks really, really well, and our job is to make interfaces that make people happy on top of that. If you want to learn more, there's a great six-minute video by CGP Cray, How Machines Learn. And if you want to go deep, there's actually a learning course, a training course, a proper university training course, openly free by Microsoft, that at the end of it, you get a certification. It's at AKS Dom as Learn AI. I haven't done it myself yet because I'm not clever enough. But if you're a student right now and you want to get a proper certificate for something and go to our office down the road and want to talk to those people there, that's what you can do. Or you can work for Bosch. Yeah, we're hiring too. We're all hiring. <laughs> and that's all I have. So thanks very much. Great job, great job. Thank you so much. Um, Christian, your namesake, asks, uh, who do you think is the dominating leader for AI solutions? That depends on which market. Uh, a lot of people are doing great work in different markets. I mean, Watson from IBM, for example, concentrated fully on the medical field by now. So they're doing great work there in terms of a voice recognition. I think Siri and Cortana are on a different level, but Siri has so many more users, so basically that will learn a, mo a lot more. Self-driving cars, I don't know, I don't care, I don't have a car. Um, there's, uh, it, it's hard to say who's the winner, and I don't really like that. I'd rather have those companies share much more of these things as well. Because this is what humankind should evolve into. I would love to have a Star Trek world where money is not important anymore and computers do stuff for us, and we can be creative and find 
solutions for ourselves that we haven't even thought of. My dad and my brother is more or less the same DNA as me. Okay, my brother doesn't have any hair anymore, but that's a different <laughs> story. But uh, my dad never went to school because he was right after the war. My brother always got told he's too stupid for school, and they both have menial, boring factory jobs. I never wanted that for myself. I just basically gave myself the freedom, and I think computers can give us that freedom as well in the future so we can actually find our potential rather than being just another worker. Uh, we have one joke here that was upvoted to the very top, but I will need your help to, uh, we can do it because it's okay. uh, to roll. Human, what do you want? Computer, natural language processing. Human, point. when do we want it? Computer, when do we want what? <laughs> um, when do you think AI will be able to replace a thinking human? That depends uh, about how you define a thinking human. As I said, there's 16 different types of intelligence. There's emotional intelligence. There's all kinds of things. When it comes to like decision making, sometimes computers are better at that because they don't have bias. They, they're not like a computer can't be racist unless you teach it to be racist. But somebody can be racist without telling you. So in this case, it's it's there. And I don't think a human, a thinking human being, should be replaced by a computer. A thinking human pay, being should be aided by a computer to do better, to make better decisions. The final decision should be probably in the hand of the human, and then we get the best results out of that. So I don't think computers will replace humans in the thinking fracture because that's that. But then you see the, the, the voting results in several countries the last few years, so human intelligence is not going in a good way either. <laughs> One last question. So what are your thoughts on Zuckerberg stating that social media data protection will be sold by, by AI in the long run? That's a nice way out. It's, it's a great message to tell people to say like, oh, we, we, we're working on it. We do some very intelligent computer thingy that you don't understand. That will solve the problem. I think there is uh, much more social and, uh, and human problems in the way uh, uh, that whole thing happened with Facebook and Cambridge Analytica that I think a computer can find the flaws, but it still needs a human to say like, yeah, actually, sorry, we shouldn't have done that. So I, I wouldn't want to be Zuckerberg right now, no matter how rich he is, and he's actually done a good job uh, trying to defend himself. But uh, I think that was just a way to say, like, well, we're working on it. Just trust us. And I'm like, well, we trusted you last time. What happened there? So it's a very, st it's a very, a very simple way to always say, like, the next. I mean, every engineer will hear that, like, oh, I know we don't have time to fix that, but in the next iteration, you can do the magical, beautiful things. That never happens. So let's not, let's not think that computers can help us with our own mess that we created by computers. So that would be dangerous. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Um, there were a lot of questions regarding uh, the safety and um, a lot of uh, Black Mirror references. Any Black Mirror fans in the room? Good. Uh, the next topic is just about that. AI safety. Mr. Robert Miles, you have the floor. <laughs>